Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, the inaugural lecture of the 2022 Development Matters Series, which is supported by Irish Aid. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Robert Mardini, Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross, who's been given generous uh, time to us out of his busy schedule. Director General Mardini will speak about the international humanitarian landscape in 2022. And his address will last about 20 minutes. And after that, after his keynote, we'll proceed with questions from you and from the audience. You'll be able to join us today's discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them once Director General Martini, Mar Mardini has finished his presentation. And also, can we, I remind you to use the Q&A function for the recording. And of course, you can also use Twitter. The handle is at IIEA. We're also live streaming this afternoon's session. So a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us through YouTube. Robert Mardini is Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, responsible for steering the organization's global humanitarian activities and its 20,000 staff in more than 100 countries with a master's degree in civil engineering and hydraulics from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, EPFL. Robert began his ICRC career in 1997, going on to serve as director, Deputy Director General from 2010 to 2012, Regional Director of the Near and Middle East 2012 to 2018 and Permanent Observer of the United Nations and Head of Delegation New York 2018 to 2020. So before we turn to Mr. Mardini, I'd like to hand the floor over to Rory de Borca, Director General of Irish Aid, to issue some opening remarks. Rory, over to you, please. Uh, thanks, Mark, uh, and hello, Robert. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to have uh, the uh, opportunity to um, be some, somewhat of a John the Baptist, uh, though hopefully with a different ending, uh, uh, for Robert today, because um, Ireland's partnership with the ICRC is, is of long standing. Uh, it's really essential. Um, and I think it's actually kind of appropriate that, that Mark, uh, you know, uh, as a former chief of staff, you know, opened up the discussion um, and, and that the Department of Foreign Affairs follows because our relation, Ireland's relationship with, with the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement goes back a long time. It predates the foundation of the state. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Geneva Conventions are, are a big part of what the, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement uh, define and are guardians of, uh, and in many ways create the framework uh, for uh, the optimal conduct of wars, but also the guarantees that open up the humanitarian space that the ICRC operates when we as a department work with you uh, to alleviate uh, the circumstances that people find themselves in you know, during or following conflicts, and also uh, which are partners in the, in the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent after natural disasters. Um, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, but particularly the ICRC, occupies a particularly unique space, you know, as a trusted interlocutor in places where, frankly, the rest of us cannot go. Your colleagues work at risk, unarmed, under the protection of a, of a flag. Uh, and do, and we know this, put their lives at risk. And many of your colleagues, sadly, uh, have died over the years. We pay them tribute. But we need the work that the ICRC does because it's in those really dangerous places, those places where people are most at risk, that humanitarian assistance and in international humanitarian law is most important. And if it wasn't for the ICRC and partners like the ICRC, I think we would see an awful lot more uh, human toll and the politics of moving from conflict into peace would be much more difficult. Robert, you know, has taken on the role uh, of leader of, of, of the ICRC, you know, only two years ago, um, while Ireland was in the chair of the, the donor, uh, the co-chair position, of, of the donor body, which is, you know, uh, which, which supports the ICRC. And, you know, it's been a difficult two years for, 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 you know, for the ICRC as it has for everybody else through a pandemic. And I think as we begin, certainly in, in, in Europe to emerge from that pandemic, we see 
a deteriorated humanitarian landscape. This year, projections suggest we need an additional 17% or there's additional 17% of people needing humanitarian assistance worldwide. That's about 50 times our population, 250 million people. Um, and COVID has released all sorts of political and security and other shocks across societies which were ill-prepared to take on the strain. And I, I fear that those strains are going to complicate your work uh, over the decade ahead, you know, and to this, you know, and, and that sense that conflict, unfortunately, is much more present in our in our world this decade. I think we'll also see the intensification of climate issues coming into the into the um, into our considerations. You know, all of this means that I think um, as we move forward, the ICRC will continue to be a really important partner for us. Um, you know, we work with you in many places at the moment, Occupy Palestinian territory, Ethiopia, the Sahel, Syria. I'd rather we had to work with you in less places. I fear, sadly, that we may have to work with you in more. Um, and we really value uh, your unique role and the humanitarian access you give. Also just want to briefly just mention the role you play on this island, uh, which is also very important, working on cross-community relations uh, on the northern part of the island, easing sectarian tensions, limiting the use of violence within and between communities, and also, you know, intersecting uh, with the work of the Irish Red Cross around prisons as well. I mean, really, really valuable work. And we're going to work with you, I think, in the future on disarmament, a really key theme of our foreign policy, protections of civilians and respect for humanitarian law, questions which I think also lead into our Security Council tenure. So really valued partner. I'm really looking forward to what you have to say to us, Mark, Robert. Um, you know, I, I think it'll be a really valuable discussion and a brilliant one for us to start uh, our reflections on development over the course of the year. So with that, Robert, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ruri. I uh, really liked your uh, introductory remarks and I think uh, uh, you, you qualified in three words how ICRC delegates operate. You said uh, they work at risk, unarmed, and protected by the, by the emblem. And I think it's, uh, it's a very uh, uh, powerful formula uh, summarizing uh, what colleagues are doing uh, across the globe. And, uh, um, uh, and yes, uh, uh, you know, we have many donors, uh, but I think that uh, the partnership we have with Ireland is of uh, high quality. Uh, because we really see eye to eye on uh, on the you know what is at the heart of our mandate of our identity, uh, international humanitarian law, uh, the, the the seven principles of the Red Cross Redressant Movement: uh, impartiality, neutrality, uh, humanity, um, and, and 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 the four others. Um, uh, and, and what, what, what I'm always impressed about Ireland is uh, that as a country, you really punch above your weight in terms of uh, uh, the generosity, in terms of uh, also uh, your might in the multilateral and policy space, which is equally important and it complements the work of our delegates uh, on the ground. And uh, uh, your current term at the Security Council is a very strong testimony to everything we are doing, moving the needle to uh, put um, at the heart of the multilateral space and the, and the United Nations Security Council, um, the, the, you know, the, put the voice, the concerns of people caught up in armed conflict and violence. And this, to me, irrespective of the yearly amount that, uh, uh, that, 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 that is an expression of the generosity of the Irish people, is, is in itself uh, priceless in terms of uh, impact. Uh, um, and two days ago, we were discussing uh, uh, how we can sharpen our evaluation and outcome-based approach and how we can measure progress. And we recognize that there are things where it's easy to measure progress, you know, a water project, a hospital, uh, the number of uh, um, uh, amputated people fitted, um, this is easy to measure, uh, but how can you measure um, uh, 
the adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, for instance. Uh, this effort started 75 years ago. And uh, it's only one year now that we can say that uh, there is a treaty that be became hard law. And, and this is the behind the scene work that uh, it is very hard to measure, but where you, you shift uh, important priorities um, uh, to the fore in order to protect lives, livelihoods uh, for something that is as important as this. So really thank you. Uh, Ruri, uh, thank you, Vice Admiral Mellet, and everyone at the IIEA uh, for this uh, warm welcome. Uh, it is uh, a great pleasure to join all of you today, albeit virtually, uh, to kick off this year's lecture series at the Institute. Uh, as I said, the ICRC really enjoys um, with Ireland a long standing and solid partnership. It is built essentially uh, on shared core values and a fundamental sense of humanity. It is built, too, on a shared desire to help some of the neediest and most vulnerable people on the planet, those uh, who are affected by armed conflict or other situations of violence. And our joint aim uh, and our challenge is to be able to do this as smartly and as strategically as possible in a way that is relevant, effective, and sustainable for affected people. ICRC and the Department of Foreign Affairs recently had our annual round table. Unfortunately, I could not be uh, physically in Dublin. Uh, and while I was uh, only able to join virtually, I was uh, really happy to see familiar faces like our old friend, uh, Ruri, uh, and to meet uh, new ones. Uh, we had valuable exchange on various organizational priorities, funding issues, uh, of course, and our work plan for 2022. You also touched uh, on a range of issues, including Ireland's current role uh, on the UN Security Council, sanctions, climate change, new technology, and the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, and, and the list, unfortunately, as you said, Ruri, or earlier, uh, is much longer than this, tragically. Uh, so this event today is, uh, is really a welcome opportunity to look at uh, some of uh, these issues in more depth, consider any that were missed and give you maybe the chance to ask a question and to engage, especially, especially those of you who are not so familiar with the ICRC. Uh, I know many of us are beginning to feel at least cautiously optimistic about the direction the COVID pandemic, uh, not least in Ireland, where I know you've uh, uh, just come out of a particularly long and hard set of restrictions. But as we all know, the pandemic won't be over until it's over everywhere, which brings me to, to share a few observations uh, on what the humanitarian context in which we are currently working typ typically uh, look like. Uh, so, so while the pandemic continues to affect all of us, uh, the ones most affected, as always, are those who are already vulnerable or marginalized. This includes, of course, those living in the midst of armed conflict or, or violence, uh, for whom the pandemic is just one of multi-layered threats and sources of, of hardship. Um, the humanitarian environment in many of today's armed conflict is characterized by complexity and unpredictability. I saw this all too clearly when I visited the Mali uh, last year, at the end of last year. Uh, like in many of the contexts where the ICRC works, people affected by conflict are particularly vulnerable to a whole host of other pressures, including accelerating climate change and outbreaks of diseases. Uh, I met people displaced multiple times because of conflict, but also because of increasingly erratic weather patterns and growing competition over scarce resources. Uh, we see similar dynamics playing out across the Sahel and far beyond in places like uh, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Iraq, Somalia, and Yemen, to mention but a few. Uh, most of them have been suffering conflict-induced humanitarian crisis for many decades. Uh, in Afghanistan, more than four decades of armed conflict have destroyed the economy, infrastructure, and basic services, and left people exhausted and traumatized. Uh, the, country, uh, the, the country's humanitarian crisis was alarming, even before more recent events have brought brought it into the verge of total collapse uh, and also uh, under the spotlight of um, 
of the media. So uh, long-term conflict obviously makes people and their environment uh, less able to absorb new shocks like the COVID pandemic. Just a parenthesis, I was uh, speaking uh, yesterday with our head of delegation in, in Ukraine and she had to cancel a field trip to uh, in the Donbass uh, because uh, uh, COVID is now uh, uh, affecting a, a large portion of our staff, uh, the same uh, in Azerbaijan, uh, the same in, uh, in, in many other places uh, like Afghanistan, where I'm planning to visit the end of February and the visit might be postponed because of uh, now COVID and Omicron uh, hitting hard. Uh, um, um, uh, so, so I was uh, just saying that uh, uh, yeah, places like Afghanistan, Gaza, Mali, South Sudan, uh, all those places, COVID-19 was not uh, on the top uh, of anyone's list of concern. And that was interesting. It, it's so high on our agenda. But when you ask people in the Gaza Strip, for instance, uh, in June, uh, what their priorities are, COVID is, is not uh, among the top five. Uh, so is the case in Afghanistan. And it doesn't mean that COVID is not pre present there. Uh, simply because a host of other problems were considered must, more urgent by those affected, yet uh, the fact that the pandemic is still raging after two years highlights that uh, what many of us have been saying for a long time, uh, which is the, 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 the brutal reality and truth, without global vaccine equity, including in countries in conflict, the whole world is at risk. I mean, let's not forget that in countries like uh, Somalia, Syria, Yemen, uh, the rate of vaccination um, is revolving around the uh, five to 10% maximum. So you can imagine uh, the long way ahead to reach that uh, objective. Uh, then there is uh, the very nature of modern warfare, uh, which is generally more protracted, more fragmented, and more urbanized than any other time in recent history. Even the most uh, fundamental rules of international humanitarian law are frequently violated by warring sides. Uh, sometimes it is hard even to identify the parties, uh, never mind engage with them on their obligations to protect civilians. Um, then you have the shifting and splintering alliances of armed groups uh, fighting on many fronts for many different reasons uh, in the norm. Uh, is becoming the norm in, in, in so many contexts. And you add, of course, uh, uh, criminality to political grievances uh, and sometimes uh, uh, more radicalized way of thinking. Uh, and just as diverse uh, are the methods and means of warfare used. Uh, and I'm sure that these uh, resonates uh, with you, uh, Vice Admiral. These are characterized in some cases by what may be described as reckless disregard for the protection of civilians, uh, waging battle in the midst of a densely populated urban area, sometimes with highly explosive weapon is just one sadly widespread example that is killing and maiming uh, uh, thousands across the globe. Uh, the suffering uh, this causes mainly for civilians is simply immense. Uh, the devastation we have witnessed over the years in cities such as Aleppo, Gaza, Mosul, for example, will have consequences lasting for generations. Uh, beyond catastrophic loss of life, livelihoods, infrastructure, and, and services, which are, of course, the, the, the most visible part of this uh, impact, uh, there is also uh, the invisible scars of war, which are uh, mental health uh, and the, all the traumas uh, that, um, that, that are deep-seated in, uh, in, in communities and with the people with whom we discuss. Uh, in fact, the ICRC published uh, a new report just last week um, comprising uh, over a decade of research across more than 15 contexts. The report underscores how devastating these weapons are when used in populated areas and why it is so urgent and critical for states and all parties to conflict to avoid using them. Ireland is taking a leading role on this issue on the multilateral stage, steering the work to reach a political declaration to address the humanitarian harm arising uh, from the use of explosive weapons in populated areas. 
put, put these trends together with a rapid urbanization, mass migration and climate change, and the prognosis is even worse. Another pressing concern is the growing risks posed by autonomous weapon systems, including so-called killer robots uh, that are unpredictable or designed to target humans. Uh, clear and legally binding boundaries are urgently needed in our view to prohibit these kinds of weapons systems. And while humanitarian needs are increasingly globally, uh, so too are the constraints on humanitarian organizations to respond effectively. Uh, financial, economic, and political pressures due to, to the pandemic and intensifying uh, what we might call a blatant nationalization of overseas aid by some states uh, and the further erosion uh, of multilateralism. Uh, the politicization and manipulation of aid is an ongoing uh, and huge challenge for us. It puts uh, pressure on humanitarian organizations and effectively holds civilians populations to ransom. A particular concern is the growing negative impact of sanctions and counter terrorism measures on humanitarian aid preventing or restricting the ability of conflict affected people to access the protection and, assist and assistance that they need. And here it's not just uh, about the access of humanitarian organization, it's also about the access of communities to uh, critical um, and life-saving services. Um, we, we see a clear trend uh, of states and donors uh, transferring the risks associated with operating in fragile, uh, and as you said, Ruri, at-risk uh, context um, environment to humanitarian and local actors. This is simply unsustainable uh, and wrong uh, in our view. All this is uh, happening against a very worrying backdrop of misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, and propaganda online, uh, which is an extension to the battlefield in the, uh, in the cyberspace uh, and in the uh, internet. Technology and data can be of tremendous support for conflict-affected population and humanitarian organizations working with them, but they can also be a significant source of risk and harm. We see a definite risk a rise sorry, in, in the use of digital technologies to spread harmful information or to effectively weaponize information in places affected by war and violence. Cyber attacks, including the use of ransomware, will only increase. Uh, we know that. Uh, we experienced the painful, uh, brutal reality of this just a couple of weeks ago when a massive and highly sophisticated um, data breach targeted or cyber attack targeted uh, the data and personal information of some 515,000 people receiving services from the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. This appalling breach happened even though We've worked hard in recent years with the trusted partner to maintain, beef up, reinforce um, our cybersecurity and uh, our uh, data protection um, policies and systems. This is a real game changer and a major uh, concern. Um, and as an organization, I can tell you it was a punch in the face. Uh, uh, we were shaken to the core because. Uh, it's really at the heart of uh, uh, the trust that we build with people we serve uh, to, to be a trusted repository of their uh, data. So when this type of crisis happened, of course, uh, it is a huge blow uh, to, uh, to our role and our mandate. Uh, the implication for the ICRC of these various trends uh, that I mentioned uh, in terms of uh, being able to deliver a relevant, effective, and sustainable humanitarian response are widely ranging and complex. I know uh, we'll talk in more detail shortly about some of the specifics, uh, uh, but very briefly though, uh, a few of our key priorities going forward. So in terms of uh, COVID-19 response, uh, I think uh, ensuring equitable access to vaccines is our top priority. It's a global priority, uh, but for us, ICRC, this is uh, uh, our focus will be the most vulnerable or difficult to access communities, very often in places controlled by uh, armed groups um, where the, the services of a state uh, do not reach. Uh, 
uh, and we need here to help people and communities find ways to cope with long-term impact of the pandemic, which has deepened ongoing humanitarian needs, uh, livelihood support, access to education and mental health and psychosocial support are just a few examples. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, addressing uh, the toxic effects of uh, converting climate change and conflict, which is um, uh, a reality that we are facing more and more, uh, we urgently need to find ways to keep people and communities adapt. Uh, as we highlighted at COP26, this means closing the funding gap between conflict affected, um, mainly low income countries and middle income countries. Um, and, and it means committing more funding to adaptation efforts, which still lags far behind funding for actions to mitigate the impact of climate change. We need to mobilize uh, those who are best placed to ensure that climate action and finance reach communities affected by conflict, including uh, national and local authorities, international financial institutions, and the private sector. Another key priority is for us to leverage data and invest in digital transformation, including new services for affected population. And at the same time, we need to work even harder with our partners to keep ahead of the game in terms uh, uh, to preventing and mitigating the growing threat of cyber attacks. Uh, all of our priorities highlight the importance of strategic partnerships, which um, uh, are critical for us uh, within and beyond the humanitarian sector. This, of course, includes leveraging the voice and footprint of our global network, the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, 192 national societies, 14 million volunteers. But of course, we need uh, to go much uh, further in terms of partnership. We need to strengthen our relation with also emerging powers to secure additional political support and funding and to expand our outreach uh, uh, of our humanitarian uh, diplomacy. We need to better tap into the private sector, including large tech companies to co-create uh, solutions at scale for affected people and raise capital in innovative ways. And we need to strengthen our partnerships uh, with the development actors to better achieve sustainable humanitarian impact at the intersection of uh, the humanitarian and development world, uh, because precisely conflicts are becoming more and more protracted. On average, if you take the top 15 ICRC operations, those are contexts where uh, we've been present uh, on average for 35 or 36 years. Uh, various initiatives are currently being explored, including with the World Bank. Uh, these are part of our overall efforts to enlarge our funding base and diversify our income sources, uh, and also to leverage uh, solutions for people affected, for civilians and people affected by armed conflict. Even if it's not the ICRC implementing those solutions, we can bring together uh, partners who can uh, implement. Um, uh, case in point is a water project in Goma, where uh, around the table you have the World Bank, you have other development agencies, you have the private sector, you have the Régie des Eaux uh, in, in Goma, and the, it's a project that will um, uh, offer a, new water supply sources for 300,000 people. It's not a project ICRC will do, but it's we can play a catalytic role here. Um, Ireland remains one of our key trusted partners, and I can never repeat this enough. Uh, your support and that of the Irish people goes well beyond funding alone. Uh, your staunch defense of international humanitarian law and humanitarian principles is invaluable. We have a shared appreciation of how critically important it is to strengthen the resilience of people and communities affected by long running conflict and complex crises. We are looking forward to strengthening our cooperation still further with Irish, uh, Irish aid and the Irish Red Cross. As you mentioned earlier, Ruri, on humanitarian issues of shared concern um, around the world. During our meeting with the DFA, we made the following three key requests uh, to the Irish authorities as our uh, unique partner. Uh, firstly, 
use your remaining year as a member of the UN Security Council to continue to advocate for respect of international humanitarian law and humanitarian principles, putting the needs of conflict-affected populations at the center of, of the debate. Uh, second, uh, use your influence among the donor community to explain the importance and the value of the good humanitarian donor principles that we have been discussing for many uh, years now. And third, uh, be a thought partner to the ICRC as we adapt to needs and the environment. Uh, Dublin is known for hosting the European headquarters of many tech companies and for having an innovative approach to partnership. Please help us in flagging our digital objectives and support, uh, support us in developing relationships beyond the usual suspects. Your wealth of ideas, expertise, and resources be it in the domain of communication technologies, healthcare, and a wide range of others uh, can help us to co-create humanitarian solutions. Together, we can better rise to the challenge of alleviating the suffering of the country, uh, of the countries and the countless people affected by armed conflict uh, or violence. So many thanks again uh, to the IIEA uh, for the very warm welcome and for hosting this event. And without further ado, I'd be happy to answer uh, to any questions you might have. Over to you, Vice Admiral. Uh, excellent, uh, Tour de Force, and thanks very much for your very broad um, analysis. I suppose I have a number of questions coming in, but uh, one of the um, questions and it's linked to your issue with regards to building coalitions, um, does the ICRC welcome the rise in privately uh, funded humanitarian um, activities and actors? Of course, because I mean, our, um, our analysis today, unfortunately, is uh, that we see a growing gap between uh, humanitarian needs and uh, the existing collective response of uh, local organization, humanitarian organization. So this gap is widening uh, and we see a plateauing of uh, our traditional donors uh, for legitimate reasons. The pandemic has, has been hitting hard now for two years. Uh, so countries have to prioritize. So we need urgently as a humanitarian sector to diversify our sources of funding and uh, uh, the private sector uh, can and should play a role. Uh, uh, this is why we are exploring uh, new financing uh, uh, models uh, to, to, to complement uh, the, the very generous support of, uh, of key donors. Uh, of course, when it comes to ICRC, uh, it is uh, so important that uh, irrespective of where the money comes from, um, we are able to use it in an impartial way based really on our objective assessment of the needs of the populations we serve uh, and not be asked by uh, donors to favor, for instance, one population to the other. So we have criteria to accept funds and of course, uh, very stringent uh, uh, ESG and, and due diligence. We cannot accept money from uh, weapon producer, for instance, and for obvious reasons, or um, you know, uh, uh, tobacco companies, uh, or anything that threatens health. Uh, and we have a resource mobilization strategy that is very ambitious in terms of also stepping up um, uh, and and garnering more support from the private sector and uh, uh, the public also. Thanks very much. Um, I, and, and it's linked to that, a, a question from Valerie Hughes, who, who, who raises um, a recent Human Rights um, Watch report on, I suppose, some corruption in the delivery of humanitarian support and humanitarian organizations in Syria. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that report and a question with regards to um, a, a failure in transparency. Uh, and, and linked to that also, while we're on Syria, is a, is a tragic question there from Book from Kalani, who talks about the death of uh, three of his brothers in one of the uh, camps in Syria. He makes the point that ICRC have never mentioned these camps. Now, I, I, I'm not aware of the, the situation with that, but is there more that can be done, first of all, in the context of endeavouring to ensure that a governance of a humanitarian aid is transparent and keeping with your principles 
and uh, how much of a challenge is that in the context of um, the need to service, uh, I suppose, vulnerable populations and at the same time, sometimes not having the access to actually deal with the level of transparency you would like. And secondly, perhaps uh, you could just comment on Gofran Kulani's question over some of these camps in Syria that seem to uh, still exist and is there anything more that can be done? Sure. Um, no, thank you for the, the very important question. So uh, we, we take uh, um, uh, measuring what we do very seriously at ICRC and we are an organization um, which has a by and large a, a direct uh, delivery modus, modus operandi. Um, uh, so, so, of course, we work hand in hand with National Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, uh, but it's not, we, we don't uh, uh, delegate or subcontract the risk. Uh, and as Ruri mentioned earlier, um, uh, we work at risk in the most difficult places. And uh, this is where uh, it is important to have. Uh, sometimes delegates who are not from the very country uh, to be to be able to operate not only in an impartial way but to be perceived as such which means in concrete terms that uh, if we take a, a context like Syria um, uh, the ICRC has certainly been one of the organizations who had most its feet on the ground in terms of negotiating with armed groups uh, uh, in order to um, uh, garner acceptance uh, and uh, good security conditions in order to be able to cross front lines. And this enable us to ensure or limit the risks of uh, diversion of aid, which is uh, part of life in humanitarian settings because uh, uh, those are countries where uh, security is not guaranteed everywhere and where there is an incompressible uh, risk, but uh, we are hard at work at ICRC to minimize that risk at all times. And uh, uh, to do this, uh, very often uh, we pay the ultimate price. Uh, I mean, if we take a country like Syria, until today, we still have an unresolved hostage crisis that uh, started uh, back in 2013. Uh, we manage uh, uh, hostage crisis uh, in many other places. Uh, we have colleagues who are sometimes uh, victims of uh, severe security incidents, in including uh, sometimes paying the, the ultimate price. And this is because we want to um, give assurance as much as possible that uh, you know, the taxpayer money uh, that our donors uh, entrust us with is used in the best possible way. Uh, so of course, it's nobody can give a 100% guarantee, uh, but we are also very transparent when there is a case of uh, diversion or corruption that is reported to our uh, to the Office of uh, Ethic uh, Risk Management and Compliance uh, that is in my office. Uh, actually, uh, we. Uh, uh, we inform our donors of the case and how we are managing it and the scope, the magnitude uh, of it. Uh, uh, but uh, we are really hard at work to minimize the number of those cases. And uh, um, it, it, is, uh, it is also the, 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 the trust vis-a-vis -vis the people we serve because the, 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 the complexity is always uh, in, in all the contexts where we operate is the fact that we cannot help as much as we can everyone. So we have to prioritize, and those are sometimes difficult uh, decisions. Regarding the camps in Syria, I think that uh, uh, the question refers to, uh, to the camps in the Northeast. Um, uh, I, I don't have the latest on those camps, but uh, the ICRC is one of the um, uh, few organizations present in Al Hol camp, uh, uh, also running a health um, facility there with a presence, a permanent, almost a permanent presence. We have a presence in, in Hasake. We also uh, visit the camps in Al Roj and other places in the nor e Northeast. And we, we visit uh, detention facilities. 
uh, and detainees. So I don't know the specifics about uh, the recent visits, but uh, uh, everything we see and we discuss in some of those places are not automatically things uh, that we will reveal in the public domain because uh, those are also part of our modalities. When the ICRC visit a prison uh, and if we uh, bear witness, for instance, for ill treatment, uh, um, we will not say it publicly. We will say it first to the detaining authorities because the purpose of our visits is really to bring about uh, a behavioral change and uh, improving the living conditions for the detainees. So we, we, we impress on the detention authorities, on the, on the political authorities uh, to, to reach this change. And this doesn't happen overnight. It's, it's a long-term work. And the, what is absolutely key is the fact that the ICRC can repeat uh, its visits uh, and, and raise the concerns in a confidential way in order to uh, build trust and try to uh, generate positive change for the for the detainees. Uh, so, so it's not automatic that the ICRC will go public uh, uh, following some some missions. Of course, uh, we have no problem to be public about uh, supporting a hospital or uh, building a new water supply scheme but we will not say publicly what we see in prisons. Um, and this is by design and by definition. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for that uh, response. There is a, a question there from, I think it's Conor Galvin, and he's just raising uh, how important are exercises like Exercise Viking um, over the last number of years, I think in my last job, I, we certainly collaborated with the uh, Swedish authorities on, on these exercises that have a very important protection of civilians dimension and working in partnership with the ICRC. Um, are they of value and is there more that can be done in that kind of context whereby we're institutionalizing that requirement of protection of civilians into the mentality of forces that often have to go to challenging um, theaters? No, absolutely. This is part, uh, this is an important part of our work. I mean, the ICRC is not just uh, um, a humanitarian organization delivering aid on the ground. It's, a, it's an organization that was entrusted by states. I mean, states are the high contracting parties uh, to the Geneva Conventions, and they uh, entrusted the ICRC the, uh, to, to, uh, to develop international humanitarian law and to promote international humanitarian law and uh, uh, to ensure that it is uh, respected. Uh, so uh, this type of programs are absolutely critical to uh, to trained armed forces. Uh, uh, we try to do the same with armed groups when there is uh, uh, an appetite and interest to do so, because it is critical to have those uh, reflexes uh, built in so that when, when a conflict happens, uh, they are part of the uh, of the natural behavior, uh, you know, the, the three key principles. At the end of the day, everything boils down to, to the principles of uh, uh, precaution, uh, taking every precaution to protect civilians, uh, uh, distinction, uh, making the distinction between um, civilians and uh, military objects or targets, uh, uh, and the proportionality. Uh, sky is not the limit uh, when it comes to using force. Uh, and um, the, the, the earlier we are able to have those carved out in the thinking of uh, students uh, at universities and uh, uh, people serving in armies, um, the, 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 the better we, we minimize the, you, you know, the, 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 that mistakes happen in, in armed conflict. Uh, and we try to do this with armed groups where we, the, the, the uh, the aim is the same, but maybe the, the ways is, are different. And here we, we connect with the religious leaders, for instance, uh, uh, and uh, uh, ask their support to convey the messages in a way that will resonate with the armed groups. Uh, uh, for instance, I remember in Iraq, uh, we were able to impress, impress on Grand Ayatollah Sistani on... Uh, IHL and he he made the fatwa um, in Arabic uh, referring to uh, to the Quran and Islam uh, to, uh, to to remind the, the same rules at the end of the day uh, protecting 
civilians, uh, uh, that rape is prohibited by Islam, that uh, 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 humane treatment of detainees. Uh, when this is said by Ayatollah Sistani, it has a much greater impact on uh, the, popular, um, um, the, the, the popular mobilization units, Al-Hajj al al-Shabi, then uh, if an ICRC delegate comes and lectures with the Geneva Conventions, but the, the aim is the same, and the, we feel that the impact uh, uh, here can be very powerful. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, and I, I think on that, just linking to a question here from Susan Keating, given that gender-based violence has been prosecuted as war crimes, crimes against humanity, and in some cases the most grievous of all, the crime of genocide, is there more the international community needs to be doing uh, given that we've just recently passed the uh, anniversary, the 20th anniversary of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. And, and should, should um, countries where gender gap is greatest be called out? Well, um, our angle at ICRC will always be armed conflict and uh, gender-based violence, uh, sexual violence, unfortunately, is all too common in armed conflict. Uh, and uh, as an institution, the ICRC pivoted. Uh, uh, and our approach today is, uh, un unless proven otherwise, sexual violence and gender-based violence is there. Uh, and this is the working assumption of our delegates. So uh, in detention facilities, in camps, uh, uh, in, in areas controlled by maybe uh, armed groups uh, uh, who have propensity for violence, uh, we, we factor this in as part of the reality uh, in our dialogue uh, on international humanitarian law, but also in our humanitarian response. Uh, uh, and and we, have, uh, we have invested a lot recently in this. Uh, um, if you take a context like Ethiopia today, for instance, uh, um, uh, our health response factors in uh, sexual violence uh, in a systematic way uh, we have the opportunity to support uh, um, uh, people who have suffered uh, sexual violence. Uh, um, so, so this, of course, uh, brings help, uh, psychosocial support, but it also feeds our dialogue with uh, parties to the conflict, which is uh, also uh, important. Uh, uh, so, so I think the, the, the message here to all states, I mean, in armed conflict, uh, uh, sexual and gender-based violence is uh, is prohibited clearly. Uh, so of course, uh, states parties to the conflicts have the obligation to respect, but but states parties to the Geneva Conventions have also the responsibility to ensure respect under Article One, Common to the Four Geneva Conventions. So uh, so every country has uh, a role to play and to move the needle um, towards a place where. Uh, the world will be uh, with less uh, of, of this outrageous uh, uh, violations. Uh, uh, the ICRC cannot, I mean, uh, cannot uh, move the needle on countries that are not in armed conflict uh, um, uh, with the gender gap. Uh, uh, of course, we can we can discuss it, but uh, we we don't have a, um, a clear role to be able to 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 discuss this that was the other part of the question yeah thanks very much robert and um just to, I, I think in your few words you mentioned the the challenge in terms of climate change and climate breakdown and the penalties associated with that are, are the union the institutions if you like uh, fit for purpose in the context of the protection of human rights as we move forward because of these new types of transnational impacts that uh, impact on people? Well, well, we see more and more the interplay between climate change and violence. Uh, um, and, and we see now more people leaving everything behind because uh, whether a direct consequence of climate change, take extreme weather events and uh, um, uh, more intense uh, cycles of floods and droughts, uh, or uh, the more indirect uh, shrinking uh, water uh, resources uh, and shrinking grazing lands uh, increases the increase. Sorry, the 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 the, the tension and and armed violence uh, between uh, 
uh, herders and agronomist communities and uh, it, it, it uh, generates violence and also displacement of population and uh, people who flee their homes who live in camps because uh, of this phenomenon. Uh, so um, uh, again, the ICRC will always uh, be supporting people um, uh, affected by these, uh, these compounded crises. Um, uh, and, uh, and we're trying now to, uh, to really, uh, through the new climate and environment charter that uh, we launched with the IFRC in May, and to which now we have more than 200 signatories, most of them humanitarian organization, but states started to uh, also sign uh, the United States, Switzerland and, and Norway. <clears throat> and the idea is really to walk the talk in terms of also humanitarian organization, factoring in uh, climate risk in their programs, uh, but also at the same time reducing their climate, uh, their carbon footprint. In terms of <clears throat> human rights, uh, uh, you, we always try to leverage international humanitarian law and human rights always in the best interest of, of people. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and have the conversations with the states uh, on, on this. Those are difficult conversations. Uh, um, a, a part of um, uh, human rights in connection with displacement is uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 principle of non refoulement, which is important, uh, which often uh, we evoke with the states to ensure that uh, people are not forced to go back to their countries if they are threatened by uh, any retaliatory measures, for instance. Well, thank you very much. I see a question there from uh, Anthony Brogan about the. Um, your views on the, the, the deterioration of the landscape in Eastern Europe, where recently MSF have withdrawn um, uh, their services. And uh, is that, a, 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 I suppose, a worrying signal to us? Where, where in, in Ukraine or? Uh... In a Polish-Belarus border, where <clears throat> MSF have uh, withdrawn because of denied, their access was denied to vulnerable populations. Mm. Now this, uh... Uh, again, I did not follow the latest on that front. Uh, what we know is the fact that uh, the Red Cross Red Crescent movement is active on that border through the national, the respective national societies, and the ICRC is supporting, uh, including uh, in uh, helping uh, Red Cross societies uh, help families separated uh, get in touch again. But it's a, it's a very challenging uh, situation, obviously, and uh, it's always a very delicate balance to navigate, uh, you know, the fact that you are accepted and what you say in the public uh, domain. And uh, it, it is always a very delicate balance uh, that we, uh, we have to weigh carefully because uh, sometimes uh, being vocal in the public domain uh, uh, will have repercussions. For instance, uh, having access denied. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know again the specifics for MSF, um, but we've seen this. Uh, how delicate this is in Ethiopia, uh, where we are really navigating a very uh, delicate balance. And uh, our uh, approach at ICRC will always be to favor. I would say uh, uh, a robust and uncompromised. Uh, uh, confidential dialogue with uh, the authorities uh, rather than just um, uh, putting our uh, concerns in the public domain because this uh, very often results in uh, losing access uh, in the first place and our role and our mandate is to engage with the difficult interlocutors always in the best interest of the people we serve and sometimes it is true that, uh, um, uh, you know, you want to speak up because what you see is unbearable. Uh, but then if you, if uh, the organization is uh, denied access, uh, there is only, there is so much you can do to help. So you, you need to navigate this, uh, standing your ground when it comes to principles, uh, but uh, deciding what to say in the public domain and what to say in the 
uh, in the confidential dialogue. In another institution, you would say that you might win the battle, but you lose the war. So um, I, I fully um, <clears throat> rise with that point. Uh, just as a, a question there from uh, Solagna Sol Sol Maitra, she, she's raising and she's picking up on your point with regards to vaccine equity and um, the issue of, I suppose, vaccines being securitized by states. Is there more that um, international organizations need to do that? to um, move the politics out of the actual requirements to have access to vaccines. Yeah, I mean, we're really doing our best. We, uh, uh, together with others, OCHA, UNICEF and others, we, uh, we negotiated the, the humanitarian buffer. Uh, we know that uh, humanitarian organizations cannot uh, buy or purchase vaccines uh, uh, and it's legitimate and it's uh, the right thing to do to prioritize states uh, and the, the COVAX uh, facility. Uh, the challenge today uh, is, uh, is more vaccination than vaccines. Va vaccine is still challenging in some countries and places, but the, the most challenging thing is to um, uh, get from vaccines available in the warehouses in the capital to vaccination in the most remote village. Uh, this is the challenge. And uh, to bridge uh, this gap, uh, you need, uh, of course, funds, logistics. Uh, um, you need a lot of resources, and you need also, to a certain extent, security. Oh, understood. And um, just, to, I suppose, building on the issue of um, va vaccines and the, the mm -hmm. access to that, um, do you, do you feel that uh, theatres like Africa have um, overcome, I suppose, a hesitancy, even where vaccines are available, towards, um, let's say, widespread uh, inoculation campaigns? No, absolutely. I mean, we've seen hesitancy in uh, high-income countries in Europe. Uh, I think all European countries struggle to a certain extent with vaccine hesitancy. In, in, in uh, global south countries and uh, um, and and in particular countries affected by armed conflict uh, i mean covid is not a priority for people mm -hmm. uh, when i was in south sudan back in march last year um, uh, covid was starting to hit hard uh, the second wave i think and uh, um, people were dying and they didn't even know it was covid for many it, it was, you know, similar symptom than ma malaria. So it was uh, not an issue. And uh, uh, we've seen how hard it is to sensitize people to, uh, to get to be vaccinated in Europe. So you can imagine uh, the effort it takes uh, to, to reach the same level of uh, uh, persuasion in, in African context and in context where understandably so communities are struggling to make ends meet, uh, uh, to get their children to school, to uh, struggling with other diseases uh, and also displacement because of uh, conflict and or uh, climate change. So it's, uh, it's, it's harder. Uh, and this doesn't say anything about the av availability and the capacities of state to do this. So, so our role as ICRC is really uh, facilitate the last mile vaccination, for instance, in places uh, that are controlled by armed groups uh, where state cannot do this, we can facilitate and work hand in hand with the National Red Cross or Red Crescent Society and make it happen in, in uh, hard to reach places. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to remind everybody who's still on that uh, if you want to, please use the social platform, uh, Twitter or other, at IIEA, just to reflect the uh, excellent discussion we've had. We've come more or less to the end of our time. Um, Robert, I have huge respect for you and your institution. You personally have given remarkable leadership. Uh, and certainly I'm very proud of the relationship between Ireland and the ICRC. It goes back a, a long time. Uh, our values are common. Uh, we are both are advocates for multilateralism. And at the end of the day, that's the real, I suppose, collaborative framework that will bring civil society and the institutions of civil society forward, where people are free, where the institutions of state function and where the vulnerable are protected. I, I'd ask that you would convey on our appreciation in terms of this forum to your membership and all of those who actually go into harm's way 
often without the protection that actually uh, gives them the certainty that they need in very, very challenging environments. So thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you, Vice Admiral. It was an honor, privilege, and uh, thank you for having me and uh, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, Ireland is uh, very close to our heart at ICRC and thank you for the support uh, uh, to, to Ruri and all colleagues uh, and you, Vice Admiral. Thank, thank you. you very much.